This is jumbo size. <laughs> All right, I'm set for one more year. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you very much. Good job. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Prayers we sing in PPT form. So what we have in PT, PPT form now? Most of the form, most of the thing here. Everything. Not everything, we're still working on it. Okay. Most of the prayers in the blue folder are there. Really? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, Good to know. Sorry. And the Bhagavad Gita is there, both English and So this Brahma Samhita now is uh, on PPT? That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really nice. Thank you. Hare Krishna. So let's start with the translations from the Sri Brahma Samhita with a new PowerPoint presentation. We'll read five translations each. Actually, let's read, let's try today, we'll read the translations together rather than reading five each. Krishna, who is known as Govinda, is the Supreme Godhead. He has an eternal, blissful, spiritual body. He is the origin of all, he has no other origin, and he is the prime cause of all causes. The spiritual place of transcendental pastimes of Krishna is portrayed in the second verse. The super excellent station of Krishna, which is known as Gokula, has thousands of petals and a corolla like that of a lotus sprouted from a part of his infinitary aspect, the whorl of the leaves being the actual abode of Krishna. We can read all together. The whorl of that transcendental lotus is the realm wherein dwells Krishna. It is a hexagonal figure, the abode of the indwelling, predominated, and predominating aspect of the Absolute. Like a diamond, the central supporting figure of self-luminous Krishna stands as the transcendental source of all potencies. The holy name consisting of 18 transcendental letters is manifested in a hexagonal figure with sixfold divisions. The whirl of that eternal realm, Gokula, is the hexagonal abode of Krishna. Its petals are the abodes of gopis who are part and parcel of Krishna, to whom they are most lovingly devoted and are similar in essence. The petals shine beautifully like so many walls. The extended leaves of that lotus are the garden-like tam, that is, the spiritual abode of Sri Radhika, the most beloved of Krishna. The surrounding external plane of Gokula is described in this verse. There is a mysterious quadrangular place named Shweta Dweep surrounding the outskirts of Gokula. Shweta Dweep is divided into four parts on all sides. The abode of Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradumna, and Aniruddha are separately located in each of these four parts. These four divided abodes are enveloped by the fourfold human requirements such as piety, wealth, passion, and liberation, as also by the four Vedas, namely Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva, which deal with the mantra and which are the basis of achievements of the fourfold mundane requirements. 
Ten tridents are fixed in the ten directions, including the zenith and nadir. The eight directions are decorated with the eight jewels of Mahapadma, Padma, Shanka, Makara, Kachapa, Mukunda, Kunda, and Nila. There are ten protectors, Dikpalas, of the ten directions in the form of mantra. The associates of the hues of blue, yellow, red, and white, and the extraordinary potencies bearing the names of Bhimala, etc., shine on all sides. The Lord of Gokula is the transcendental supreme Godhead, the own self of eternal ecstasies. He is the superior of all superiors and is busily engaged in the enjoyments of the transcendental realm and has no association with his mundane potency. Krishna never consorts with this illusory energy. Still, her connection is not entirely cut off from the absolute truth. When he intends to create the material world, the amorous pastime, in which he engages by consorting with his own spiritual chit potency, Rama, by casting his glance at the deluding energy in the shape of sending his time energy, is an auxiliary activity. The secondary process of association with Maya is described. Rama Devi, the spiritual chit potency, beloved consort of the Supreme Lord, is the regular tricks of all entities. The divine plenary portion of Krishna creates the mundane world. At creation, there appears a divine halo of the nature of his own subjective portion, Shwangsha. This halo is divine Shambhu, the masculine symbol or manifested emblem of the Supreme Lord. This halo is the dim twilight reflection of the supreme eternal effulgence. This masculine symbol is the subjective portion of divinity who functions as progenitor of the mundane world, subject to the supreme regulatrix, Niyati. The conceiving potency in regard to mundane creation makes her appearance out of the supreme regulatrix. She is Maya, the limited, non-absolute apara potency, the symbol of mundane feminine productivity. The intercourse of these two brings forth the faculty of perverted recognition, the reflection of the seed of the procreative desire of the Supreme Lord. All offspring of the consort of the great Lord Maheshwar of this mundane world are of the nature of the embodiment of the mundane masculine and feminine generative organs. The person embodying the material causal principle that is the great Lord of this mundane world, Maheshwar Shambhu, in the form of the male generating organ, is joined to his female consort, the limited energy Maya, as the efficient causal principle. The Lord of the world, Mahavishnu, is manifest in him by his subjective portion in the form of his glance. The Lord of the mundane world, Mahavishnu, possesses thousands of thousands of heads, eyes, hands, he is a source of thousands of thousands of avatars in his thousands of thousands of subjective portions. He is the creator of thousands of thousands of individual souls. The same Mahavishnu is spoken of by the name of Narayan in this mundane world. From that eternal person has sprung the vast expanse of water of the spiritual causal ocean, the subjective portion of Sankarshan who abides in Paravyoma, the above Supreme Purusha with thousands of subjective portions reposes in the state of divine sleep, yoga nidra, in the waters of the spiritual causal ocean. The spiritual seeds of Sankarsana existing in the pores of skin of Mahavishnu are born as so many golden sperms. These sperms are covered with five great elements. The same Mahavishnu entered into each universe as his own separate subjective portions. The divine portions that enter into each universe are possessed of his majestic extension, that is, they are the eternal universal soul, Mahavishnu, possessing thousands of thousands of heads. The same, uh, the same Mahavishnu created Vishnu from his left limb, Brahma, the first progenitor of beings, from his right limb, and from the space between his two eyebrows, Shambhu, the divine masculine manifested halo. The function of Shambhu in relation to jivas is that this universe enshrining the mundane egotistic principle has originated from Shambhu. Thereupon the same great personal Godhead assuming the threefold forms of Vishnu, Prajapati and Shambhu entering into the mundane universe plays the pastimes of preservation, creation and destruction of this world. 
This pastime is contained in the mundane world. Hence it being perverted, the Supreme Lord, identical with Mahavishnu, prefers to consort with the goddess Yoga Nidra, the constituent of his own spiritual chit potency, full of the ecstatic trance of eternal bliss appertaining to his own divine personality. When Vishnu, lying in the ocean of milk, wills to create this universe, a golden lotus springs from his navel pit. The golden lotus with its stem is the abode of Brahma, representing Brahma Loka or Satya Loka. Before their conglomeration, the primary elements in their nascent state remained originally separate entities. Non-application of the conglomerating process is the cause of their separate existence. Divine Mahavishnu, primal Godhead, through association with his own spiritual chit potency, moved Maya, and by the application of the conglomerating principle, created those different entities in their state of cooperation. And after that, he himself consorted with Yoga Nidra by way of his eternal dalliance with his spiritual chit potency. By conglomerating all those separate entities, he manifested the innumerable mundane universes and himself entered into the inmost recess of every extended conglomerate, Virad Vigraha. At that time, those jivas who had lain dormant during the cataclysm were awakened. The same jiva is eternal and is for eternity and without a beginning joined to the Supreme Lord by a tie of an eternal kinship. He is transcendental spiritual potency. The divine lotus which springs from the navel pit of Vishnu is in every way related with a spiritual tie with all souls and is the origin of four-faced Brahma first in the four Vedas. <clears throat> On coming out of the lotus, Brahma, being guided by the divine potency, turned his mind to the act of creation under the impulse of previous impressions but he could see nothing but darkness in every direction. Then the goddess of learning, Saraswati, the divine consort of the Supreme Lord, said thus to Brahma, who saw nothing but gloom in all directions, O Brahma, this mantra, Klim Krishnaya Govindaya Gopijana Balabhaya Swaha, will assuredly fulfill your heart's desire. O Brahma, do thou practice spiritual association by means of this mantra, then all your desires will be fulfilled. Brahma, being desirous of satisfying Govinda, practiced the cultural acts for Krishna and Goloka, Lord of Shweta Deepa, for a long time. His meditation ran thus. There exists a divine lotus of a thousand petals augmented by millions of filaments in the transcendental land of Goloka. On its world there exists a great divine throne on which is seated Sri Krishna, the form of eternal effulgence of transcendental bliss, playing on his divine flute, resonant with the divine sound with his lotus mouth. He is worshipped by his amorous milkmaids with their respective subjective portions and extensions, and also by his external energy who stays outside, <clears throat> embodying all mundane qualities. Then Gayatri, mother of the Vedas, being made manifest, that is imparted by the divine sound of the flute of Sri Krishna, entered into the lotus mouth of Brahma, born from himself through his eight ear holes. The lotus-born Brahma, having received the Gayatri, sprung from the flute song of Sri Krishna, attained the status of the twice-born, having been initiated by the supreme primal receptor Godhead himself. Enlightened by the recollection of that Gayatri, embodying the three Vedas, Brahma became acquainted with the expanse of the ocean of truth. Thus he worshipped Sri Krishna, the essence of all Vedas, with this hymn. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, the first progenitor who is tending the cows, yield all, all desire, in abodes built with spiritual gems, surrounded by millions of purpose trees, Sir, served with great reverence and affection by hundreds of thousands of Lakshmis or gopis. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is adept in playing on his flute with blooming eyes like lotus petals, with head decked with peacock's feather, with the figure of beauty tinged with the hue of blue clouds, and his unique loveliness charming millions of cupids. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, round whose neck is swinging a garland of flowers beautified with the moon locket, 
whose two hands are adorned with the flute and jeweled ornaments, who always revels in pastimes of love, whose graceful threefold bending form of Shama Sundara is eternally manifest. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, whose transcendental form is full of bliss, truth, substantiality, and is thus full of the most dazzling splendor. Each of the limbs of that transcendental figure possesses in himself the full-fledged functions of all the organs, and eternally sees, maintains, and manifests the infinite universes, both spiritual and mundane. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is inaccessible to the Vedas, but obtainable by pure unalloyed devotion of the soul, who is without a second, who is not subject to decay, is without a beginning, whose form is endless, who is the beginning and the eternal Purusha, yet he is a person possessing. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, only the tip of the toe of whose lotus feet is approached by the yogis, who aspire after the transcendental and betake themselves to pranayama by drilling the respiration, or by the jnanis who try to find a non-differentiated Brahman by the process of illumination of the mundane extending over thousands of millions of years. He is an undifferentiated entity as there is no distinction between potency. Pot the. In his work of creation of millions of worlds, his potency remains inseparable. All the universes exist in him and he is present in his fullness in every one of the atoms that are scattered throughout the universe at one and the same time. Such is the primeval Lord whom I adore. I adore the same Govinda, the primeval Lord, in whose praise men who are imbued with devotion sing the mantra suktas told by the Vedas by gaining their appropriate beauty, greatness, thrones, conveyances, and ornaments. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, residing in his own realm, Goloka, with Radha, resembling his own spiritual figure, the embodiment of the ecstatic potency possessed of the 64 artistic activities, and the company of her confidants, Sakis, embodiments of the extensions of her bodily form, permeated and vitalized by his ever-blissful spiritual rasa. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Shama Sundar, Krishna himself, with inconceivable innumerable attributes, whom the pure devotees see in their heart of hearts with the eye of devotion tinged with the salve of love. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who manifested himself personally as Krishna and the different avatars in the world in the forms of Rama, Shinga, Vamana, etc., as his subjective portions. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, whose effulgence is the source of the non-differentiated Brahman, mentioned in the Upanishads, being differentiated from the infinity of glories of the mundane universe, appears as the indivisible, infinite, limitless truth. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is the absolute substantive principle, being the ultimate entity in the form of the support of all existence, whose external potency embodies the threefold mundane qualities, namely sattva, rajas, and tamas, and diffuses the Vedic knowledge regarding the mundane world. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, whose glory ever triumphantly dominates the mundane world by the activity of his own pastimes, being reflected in the mind of recollecting souls as the transcendental entity of ever blissful cognitive rasa. Lowest of all is located Devi Dham, mundane world. Next above it is Mahesh Dham, abode of Mahesh. Above Mahesh Dham is placed Hari Dham, abode of Hari and above them all is located Krishna's own realm named Goloka. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who has allotted their respective authorities to the rulers of those graded realms. The external potency, Maya, who is of the nature of the shadow of the chit potency, is worshiped by all people as Durga, the creating, preserving, and destroying agency of this mundane world. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda in accordance with his will, Durga conducts herself. 
just as milk is transformed into curd by the action of acids, but yet the effect curd is neither same as nor different from its cause, namely milk. So I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, of whom the state of Shambhu is a transformation for the performance of the work of destruction. The light of one candle being communicated to other candles, although it burns separately in them, is the same in its quality. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who exhibits himself equally in the same mobile manner in his various manifestations. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who is assuming his own great subjective form, who bears the name of Shesha, replete with the all accommodating potency, and reposing in the causal ocean with the infinity of the world in the pores of his hair, enjoys creative sleep, Yoga Nidra. Rama and other lords of the mundane worlds, appearing from the pores of hair of Mahavishnu, remain alive as long as the duration of one exhalation of the latter, Mahavishnu. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, of whose subjective personality Mahavishnu is the portion of portion. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, from whom the separated subjective portion, Brahma, receives his power for the regulation of the mundane world, just as the sun manifests some portion of his own light in all of the effulgent gems that bear the names of Surya Kanta, etc. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, whose lotus feet are always held by Ganesh upon the pair of tumuli protruding from his elephant head in order to obtain power for his function of destroying all the obstacles on the path of progress of the three worlds. The three worlds are composed of the nine elements, namely fire, earth, ether, water, air, direction, time, soul, and mind. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, from whom they originate, in whom they exist, and into whom they enter at the time of the universal cataclysm. The sun, who is the king of all the planets, full of infinite effulgence, the image of the good soul, is as the eye of this world. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, in pursuance of whose order the sun performs his journey, mounting the wheel of time. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, by whose conferred power are maintained the manifested potencies that are found to exist of all virtues, all vices, the Vedas, the penances, and all jivas, from Brahma to the meanest insect. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who burns up to their roots all fruit of activities of those who are imbued with devotion and impartially ordains for each the due enjoyment of the fruits of one's activities. Of all those who walk in the path of work in accordance with the chain of their previously performed works, no less in the case of the tiny insect that bears the name of Indragopa than than that of Indra, king of the Devas. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, the meditators of whom, by meditating upon him under the sway of wrath, amorous passion, natural friendly love, fear, parental affection, delusion, reverence, and willing service attain to bodily forms befitting the nature of their contemplation. I worship that transcendental seat known as Shweta Dweep, whereas loving consorts, the Lakshmis and their unalloyed spiritual essence practice the amorous service of the Supreme Lord Krishna as their only lover where every tree is a transcendental purpose tree, where the soil is the purpose gem. All water is nectar, every word is a song, every gate is a dance, the flute is a favorite attendant, effulgence is full of transcendental bliss, and the supreme spiritual entities are all enjoyable and tasty, where numberless milk cows always emit transcendental oceans of milk, where there is eternal existence of transcendental time, who is ever present and without past or future, and hence is not subject to the quality of passing away, even for the space of half a moment. That realm is known as Goloka, only to a very few self-realized souls in this world. 
on hearing these hymns containing the essence of the truth, the Supreme Lord Krishna said to Brahma, Brahma, if you experience the inclination to create offspring by being endowed with the real knowledge of the glory of Godhead, listen, my beloved, from me to this science set forth in the following five shlokas. When the pure spiritual experience is excited by means of cognition and service, bhakti, super excellent unalloyed devotion characterized by love for Godhead is awakened toward Krishna, the beloved of all souls. The highest devotion is attained by slow degrees, by the method of constant endeavor for self-realization with the help of scriptural evidence theistic conduct, and perseverance in practice. These preliminary practices of devotion, sadhana bhakti, are conducive to the realization of loving devotion. Loving devotion, then whom there is no superior well-being, who goes hand in hand with the attainment of the exclusive state of supreme bliss, and who can lead to myself. Abandoning all meritorious performances, serve me with faith. The realization will correspond to the nature of one's faith. The people of the world act ceaselessly in pursuance of some ideal. By meditating on me by means of those deeds, one will obtain devotion characterized by love in the shape of a supreme service. Listen, O Vidhi, I am the seed. That is the fundamental principle of this world of animate and inanimate objects. I am Pradhan, the substance of matter. I am Prakriti, material cause, and I am Purusha, efficient cause. This fiery energy that belongs specially to the Brahman, that inheres in you, has also been conferred by me. It is by bearing this fiery energy that you regulate this phenomenal world of animate and inanimate objects. Ishvara Parama Krishna Sakchidananda Vigraha Anadi radir govinda sarvakarana karanam sahasrapatra kamalam gokulakyam mahatpadam tatkarni karam tadama tadadam tangsha sambhavam karni karam mahadyantram shatkonam vajrakilakam Shadanga Shatpadistanam Prakritya Purushena Cha Premananda Mahananda Rasena Vastitam Hiyat Jyoti Rupena Manuna Kama Bijena Sangatam Tatkinjal Kam Tanangshanam Tatpatrani Shriyamapi Chatur Ashram Tat Paritaha Shweta Dvipakyam Adbutam Chatur Ashram Chatur Murtesh Chatur Dhamma Chatushkritam Chatur Bi Purusharthaischa Chatur Bir Hetu Virvritam Shular Dasha Biranadam Urdbado Didrikshapi Ashtabhir nidibir jushtam, ashtabhi siddhi bistata, manu rupa ishta dashabhir dikpalai paritovratam, shamayar goraishta raktaishta shuklaishta parsha darshabahi, shobitam shakti bista birad bhutad bisamantataha, Evam Jodir Mayo Deva Sadananda Parat Paraha Atma Ramas Chetasyasti Prakritiana Samagamaha Maya Ramamanasya Navi Yogas Tayasaha Atmana Ramayare Me Tyaktvakalam Sushikshaya Niyati Sarama Devi Tatpriya Tad Vasham Tada Talingam Bhagavan Shambhur Jyoti Rupa Sanatanaha Yayoni Sapara Shakti Kamo Bijam Mahadarehe Linga Yonyat Mika Jata Ima Maheshwari Praja Shakti man purusha soyam linga rupi maheshwaraha 
Tasmin avi rabu linge maha vishnu jagat patihi sahasra shirsha purushaha sahasra ksa sahasra pad sabahur vishvama sahasram sa sahasra suhu narayana sabhagavan apastas mat sanatanad Avirasit karanarno nidhi sankarshanat bhagaha Yoga nidram gatas tasmin sahasram sha swayam mahan Tadroma bila jaleshu bijan sankarshanat ha Haimanyandari jatani mahabhuta vritani tu Pratyandam eva me kam shad e kam shad vishati swayam Sahasra murda vishvatma maha vishnu sanatanaha Vaman gad asrajad vishnum dakshinan gad prajapatim Jyoti linga mayam shambhum kurcha deshad avasrajat Ahankarat makam vishvam tasman etad yajayata Atatayastri vidarvesha lilan udvahata kila Yoga nidra bhagavati tasya shrir eva sangata Shashikshayam tato nabes tasya padmam banir yayao Tanalam hema nalinam brahmano lokam adbutam Tadvani purva rudani karanani parasparam Samavaya prayogacca vibhinani pratak pratak Chikshakcha sajjamano ta bhagavan adi purushaha Yojayan mayaya devo yoga nidram akalpayat Yojayitva tutanyeva pravivesha swayam guham Guham pravishte tasmimstu jivatma pratibudyate Sanitya nitya sambandha prakatisya paraivasa Evam sarvatma sambandham Nabhyam padmam harera bhut Tatra brahmad babad bhuya Chatur vedi chatur mukaha Sanjato bhagavach chaktya Tatkalam kila choditaha Sashikshayam matim chakre Purva samskara samskritaha Dadarsha kevalam dvantam Nanyat kim apisarvataha Uvacha puratas tasmai tasya divya saraswati Kama Krishnaya Govinda he gopi jane ityapi Balabhaya priya vanir mantram te dasyati priyam Tapastam tape etena tapasidhir bhavishyati Atate pesa suchiram prinan govindam avyayam Shweta dvipa patim krishnam golokastam parat param Prakritya guna rupinya rupinya paryupasitam Sahasradala sambande koti kinjalka brimhite Bhumis chintam anistatra karnikare mahasane Samasinam chidanandam jyoti rupam sanatanam Shabda Brahma Mayam Benum Vadayantam Mukhambuje Vilasini Ganavratam Swarshwar Amshar Abhishtutam Atta Benu Nenadasya Trayi Muti Mayikatihi Spuranti Prabhiveshashu Mukabjani Swayambhuvaha Gayatrim Gayatas Tasmad Adigatya Sarojajaha Samskritas chari gunu na dvijatam agamat tataha Traya prabhudo ta vidhir vigna tatatva sagaraha Tushtava vena sarena stotrena nena keshavam Chintamani prakada sadma sukalpa vriksha 
ಲಕ್ಷಾವೃತು ಶುರಬೀರಿ ಪಾಲಯಂತ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀ ಸಹಸ್ರಶತ ಸಂಭ್ರಮ ಸೇವ್ಯಮಾನ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ವೇಣು ಖ್ವನಂತರವಿಂದ ದಲಾಯತಾಕ್ಷ ಬಾರ್ಹಾವತ ಸಮಸಿತಂಬುರಸುಂದರ ಕಂತರ್ಪಕೋತೀಕಮನೀಯ ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೋಭ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಆಲೋಲಚಂದ್ರಕಲ ಸದ್ವನ ಮಾಲ್ಯವಂಶಿ ರಾಜ್ಞಾನ್ ಗದಂ ಪ್ರಣಯ ಕೇಲಿ ಕಲಾ ವಿಲಾಸ ಶ್ಯಾಮಂ ತ್ರಿಬಂಗಲಿತ ನಿಯತ ಪ್ರಕಾಶ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಅಂಗಾನಿ ಯಸಕಲೇಂದ್ರಿಯ ವೃತ್ತಿ ಮಂತಿ ಪಶ್ಯಾಂತಿ ಪಾಂತಿ ಕಲಯಂತಿ ಚಿರಂ ಜಗಂತಿ ಆನಂದ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ಸದುಜ್ವಲ ವಿಗ್ರಹಸ್ಯ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಅಚ್ಯುತ ಅನಾದಿ ಅನಂತರೂಪ ಆದ್ಯ ಪುರಾಣ ಪುರುಷಂ ನವಯೌವನ ವೇದೇಶು ದುರ್ಲಭಂ ಅದುರ್ಲಭಂ ಆತ್ಮಭಕ್ತ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಪಂಥಾಸ್ತು ಕೌತಿ ಶತವತ್ಸರ ಸಂಭ್ರಗಮ್ಯೋ ವಾಯೋರಧಾಪಿ ಮನಸೋ ಮುನಿ ಪುಂಗವಾನ ಸೋಪ್ಯಸ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಪದ ಸಿಂಚಿಂತ್ಯ ತೇ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಹೇ ಕೋಪ್ಯ ಸೌರ ಚರಿತು ಜಗದಂಡ ಕೋಟಿ ಯತ್ಶಕ್ತಿರಸ್ತಿ ಜಗದಂಡ ಚಯಾಯಧಂತ ಅಂಧಾಂತರಸ್ತ ಪರಮಾನುಚಯಂತರಸ್ತ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಯದ್ಭಾವಿ ತದಯೋ ಮನುಜಾಸ್ತ ಸಂಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯ ರೂಪ ಮಹಿಮಾ ಸನಯಾನ ಭೂಷ ಸೂಕ್ತರ್ಯಮೇವ ನಗಮ ಪ್ರತಿಥೈಸ್ತು ವಂದಿ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಆನಂದ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ರಸ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾಸ್ ಕಬೀರ್ಯವ ನಿಜ ರೂಪತೆಯ ಕಲಾಭಿ ಗೋಲೋಕೆವ ನಿವಸತ್ಯ ಕಿಲಾತ್ಮಭೂತ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಪ್ರೇಮಂಜನ ಚುರಿತ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವಿಲೋಚನೆ ಸಂತಾಕ್ ಸದೈವಾರದೇಶು ವಿಲೋಕಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಶ್ಯಾಮ ಸುಂದರ ಅಚಿಂತ್ಯ ಗುಣಸ್ವರೂಪ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ರಾಮಾರಿಮೂರ್ತಿ ಶುಕಲಾ ನಿಯಮೇನ ತಿಷ್ಟಾನ್ ನಾನಾವತಾರ ಅಕರೋದ್ ಭುವನೇಶು ಕಿಂಚು ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸ್ವಯಂ ಸಮಬಾತ್ ಪರಮಾಪುಮನ್ಯೋ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಯ ಪ್ರಭಾ ಪ್ರಭವತೋ ಜಗದಂಡ ಕೋಥಿ ಕೋಥಿಶೇಷ ವಸುಧಾರಿ ವಿಭೂತಿ ಭಿನ್ನ ತದ್ಭ್ರಾಮ ನಿಷ್ಕಲ ಅನಂತ ಅಶೇಷಭೂತ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಮಾಯಿ ಯಗದಂಡ ಶತಿ ಸೂತೆ ತ್ರೈಗುಣ್ಯತಾಷಯ ವೇದ ವಿಧಾಯಮಾನ ಸದ್ವಾವಲಂಬಿ ಪರ ಸದ್ವಾಂಬಿ ಶುಧ ಸದ್ವಾಂ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಮಾರಿಪುರುಷ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಆನಂದ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ರಸಾತ್ಮತೆಯ ಮನಸು ಯ ಪ್ರಾಣಿ ಪ್ರತಿಫಲ ಸ್ಮರುತ ಮುಪೇತ್ಯ 
Leelayatena Bhuvanani Jayatya Jastram Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bajami Goloka Namni Nijadamni Taleta Tasya Devi Mahesha Haridama Suteshu Teshu Tete Prabhava Nijaya Vihitashtya Yena Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Shristi Stiti Pralaya Sadhana Shakti Rekha Jaya Vayasya Bhuvanani Vibharati Durga Ichchanu Rupam Apiyasya Chateshti Tesa Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Shiram Yatada Divikara Vishesha Yoga Sanjayate Nahitata Pratagasti Heto Yashambhutam Apitata Sambhupaiti Karyad Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Deeparchar Eva Hira Shantanam Abhyupetya Deepayate Vrvata Hetu Samana Dharma Yastadra Geva Hicha Vishnu Chaya Vibhati Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yakara Narna Bajale Bajatisma Yoga Nidra Mananta Jagadanda Saroma Kupaha Adhara Shaktim Avalambya Paramsa Murtim Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yasyaika Nishvasita Kalamata Valambya Jeevanti Loma Vilaja Jagadanda Nata Vishnur Mahansa Iha Yasya Kala Vishesho Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Basvanya Tasma Shakuleshu Nijeshu Tejaha Sviyam Kiya Prakatayat Dapitad Badatra Brahma Yeesha Jagadanda Vidhana Karta Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yatpada Pallava Yugam Vinidaya Kumbha Dvandve Pranama Samaye Saganadi Rajaha Vignan Vinhantum Alamasya Jagatrayasya Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Agnir Mahi Ganganam Ammu Buruddha Shashya Kalas Tatma Manasiti Jagatrayani Yasmad Bhavanti Vivavanti Vishanti Yamcha Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yatshakshadesa Savita Sakalagrahanam Raja Samasta Suramuti Rasheshe Tejaha Yasyagnaya Brahmati Sambrata Kala Chakro Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Mota Papan Chaya Shutayasta Pamsi Brahma Dikita Patagaba Dayascha Jivaha Yadatra Matra Vibhava Prakata Prabhava Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yastvindra Gopa Mata Vendra Mahosa Karma Bandhanu Rupa Palabhajana Mata Noti Karmani Nirdahati Kintu Cha Bhakti Bhajam Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami Yam Krodha Kama Sahaja Pranayadi Bhiti Vatsalya Moha Guru Gaurava Sevya Bhavai Sanchintya Tasya Sadrishim Tanama Purete Govinda Mari Purusham Dhamaham Bajami 
ಗೋವಿಂದಮಾರಿಪುರುಷಂ ಧಮಹಂ ಭಜಿ ಶ್ರೀಯ ಖಾಂಥಾಖಾಂಥ ಪರಮಪುರುಷ ಕಲ್ಪತರವೋ ತೃಮಾಭೂಮಿಶ್ಚಿಂಥಾಮನಿ ಗಣಮಯಿ ಥೋಯಮೃತ ಕೃತಗಾನ ನಾಟ್ಯಂ ಗಮನಮಿ ವಂಶಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಸಖಿ ಚಿದಾನಂದ ಜ್ಯೋತಿ ಪರಮಪೀಥರಸ್ವಧ್ಯಮಿ ಸಯತ್ರ ಶಿರಾಧ್ವಿಸ್ರವತಿ ಸುರಭಿಭ್ಯಶಸುಮಹಾನ್ ನಿಮೇಷಾಕ್ಯೋ ವಾ ವ್ರದತಿ ನಿ ಯಾಪಿ ಸಮಯ ಭಜೆ ಶ್ವಿತ ದೀಪಂ ಥಮಹಮಿಹ ಗೋಲೋಕಮಿತಿಯ ವಿಧಂತಸ್ತೆ ಸಂತ ಶಿತಿವಿರಲಾಕ್ಷರ ಕತಿಪಯ ಅಥೋ ವಾಚ ಮಹಾವಿಷ್ಣೋರ್ಭಗವಂಥ ಪ್ರಜಾಪಥೆ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ಮಹತ್ವ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನೆ ಪ್ರಜಾ ಸರ್ಗೆ ಚಿನ್ಮತಿ ಪಾಂಚಶ್ಲೋಕೆ ಮೀಮಂ ವಿದ್ಯಾಂ ವತ್ಸ ತತ್ವ ನಿಬೋಧ ಮೇ ಪ್ರಭುರೆ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಆತ್ಮಾನಂದಚಿನ್ಮಯಿ ಉದೇತ್ಯುನುತಮ ಭಕ್ತಿರ್ಭಗವತ್ ಪ್ರೇಮ ಲಕ್ಷಣ ಪ್ರಮಾಣೈಸ್ತತ್ಸರಾಚಾರೈ ಸ್ಥರ ವ್ಯಾಸೇರಂತರ ಬೋಧಯನಾತ್ಮನಾತ್ಮನ ಭಕ್ತಿಮ್ಯುತಮಂ ಲಭೇತ್ ಯಶ್ರೇಯಸ್ಕರ ನಾಸ್ತಿ ಯಯ ನಿವೃತ್ತಿ ಆಪ್ನುಯತ್ ಯಾರಯತಿ ಮಾ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಥಾಮೇವ ಸಾರಯೇತ್ ಧರ್ಮಾನನ್ಯಾನ್ ಪರಿತ್ಯಜ ಮಾಮೇಖಂ ಭಜ ವಿಶ್ವಸನ್ ಯಾದೃಶಿ ಯಾದೃಶಿ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಸಿಧಿರ್ಭವತಿ ತಾದೃಶಿ ಕೂರ್ವನ್ ನಿರಂತರ ಕರ್ಮ ಲೋಕೋ ಯಮನುವರ್ತೆ ತೇನಾ ಕರ್ಮನ ಧ್ಯಾನ್ ಮಂ ಪರಂ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಇಚ್ಛತಿ ಅಹಂ ಹಿ ವಿಶ್ವಸರಾಚರ ಬೀಜಂ ಪ್ರಧಾನ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಪುಮಂಶ್ಚ ಮಯಾಹಿತಂ ತೇಜ ಇದಂ ಬಿಬರ್ಷಿ ವಿದೇ ವಿದೇಹಿ ತ್ವಮತೋ ಜಗಂತಿ ಈಶ್ವರ ಪರಮ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸಚ್ಚಿದಾನಂದ ವಿಗ್ರಹ ಅನಾರಿರಾರಿರ್ಗೋವಿಂದ ಸಾರ್ವಕಾರಣ ಕಾರಣ ಶ್ರೀಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಸಂಹಿತ ಸಂಪೂರ್ಣ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಸಂಹಿತ ಕೀ ಜ And now we'll sing the Shri Guru Vashtakam. See how fast Ramananda Prabhu is. together samsara davana lalita loka tranaya karunya ganagana tvam praptasya kalyana gunarna vasya vande guru shi charanara vindam mahaprabho kirtan nritya geeta vaditra madyan manasora sena ರೋಮಾಂಚಕಂಪಾಶ್ರುತರಂಗ ಭಾಜೋ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಚರನಾರವಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಗ್ರಹಾರಾಧನ ನಿತ್ಯನಾನ ಶೃಂಗಾರಥಾನ್ ಮಂದಿರ ಮಾರ್ಜನಾದ ಯುಕ್ತ ಭಕ್ತ ನಿಯುಂಜಥೋಪಿ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಚರನಾರವಿಂದ ಚತುರ್ವಿಧ ಶ್ರೀ ಭಗವತ್ ಪ್ರಸಾದ ಸ್ವಾದನ್ನ ತೃಪ್ತಾನ್ ಹರಿಭಕ್ತ ಸಂಘಾನ್ ಕೃತ್ವಾವ ತೃಪ್ತಿ ಭಜತ ಸದೈವ ಪಂಡೇ ಗುರು ಶ್ರೀಚರನಾರವಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಿಕಾ ಮಾಧವಯೋರಪಾರ ಮಾಧುರ್ಯಲೀಲಾ ಗುಣರೂಪನಾ ಪ್ರತೀಕ್ಷಣ ಸ್ವಾದನಲೋಲು ಪಸ್ಯ 
Bande Guru Shri Charanada Vindam Nikunja Yuno Ratike Lisidai Yaya Lipir Yukti Rapekshaniya Tatrati Daksyad Atibala Basya Bande Guru Shri Charanada Vindam Sakshad Dari Dvena Samasta Shastra Ruktas tata bhavyata eva sadvi Kintu praburya priya eva tasya Bande guru shri charanara vindam Yasya prasadad bhagava prasado Yasya prasadad nakati kutopi Dhyayan stuvam stasya yashastri sandhyam Vande Guru Shri Charanada Vindam Shri Mad Guru Rashtakame Taduchar Brahme Mahurte Patita Prayatnad Yastena Vrindavananata Sakshad We could add that last uh, verse in. It goes with this. It's the Vishwanath Chakravarti. Srimad Guru Ashtakami Tadushtra Brahmi Mahurte Patita Priyatna Yastena Vrindavana Nata Sakshat. Pardon me? Yeah. It goes at, at the end, it says anyone who loudly recites this prayer during the Brahma Mahurta hour, it goes back home, back to Godhead. I will read the translation. The spiritual master is receiving benediction from the ocean of mercy, just as a cloud pours water on a forest fire to extinguish it altogether. So the spiritual master delivers the materially afflicted world by extinguishing the blazing fire of material existence. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master who is an ocean of auspicious qualities. Chanting the holy name, dancing in ecstasy, singing and playing musical instruments, the spiritual master is always gladdened by the Sankirtan movement of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because he is relishing the mellows of pure devotion within his mind. Sometimes his hair stands on end, he feels quivering in his body, and tear flows from eyes like waves. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. The spiritual master is always engaged in the temple worship of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. He also engages his disciples in such worship. They dress the deities in beautiful clothes and ornaments, clean their temple, and perform other similar worship of the Lord. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. The spiritual master is always offering Krishna four kinds of delicious food, analyzes that which is licked, chewed, drunk, and sucked. When the spiritual master sees that the devotees are satisfied by eating Bhagavat Prasad, he is satisfied. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. The spiritual master is always eager to hear and chant about the unlimited conjugal pastimes of Radhika and Madhava and their qualities, names, and forms. The spiritual master aspires to relish these at every moment. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. The spiritual master is very dear because he is expert in assisting the gopis who at different times make different tasteful arrangements for the perfection of Radha and Krishna's conjugal loving affairs within the groves of Vrindavan. I offer my most humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master. The spiritual master is to be honored as much as the Supreme Lord because he is the most confidential servitor of the Lord. This is acknowledged in all revealed scriptures and followed by all authorities. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of such a spiritual master who is a bona fide representative of Sri Hari Krishna. By the mercy of this spiritual master, one receives the benediction of Krishna. Without the grace of the spiritual master, one cannot make any advancement. Therefore, Always remember and praise the spiritual master. At least three times a day, I should offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master. Now, um, 
Shri Shikshashtakam. Yes. Well, we're followers of Sri Rupa Goswami. We're known as Rupa Nugas. So Rupa, Rupa Goswami, in this in his Sadaka Deha, which means in his the role he played in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela in this world, did things like write books and to reestablish the holy places in Vrindavan and so forth. Um, in one sense. Even in the yeah, Sadaka Deha, that is a way in which he's assisting Radha Krishna in their uh, pastimes and that um, establishing these temples, as he did, was the, a way in which, like you see here, Radha and Krishna, this is a kunj, actually. We worship Radha, a kunj means like a little, uh, yeah. And uh, so there's a way in which, uh, of course, we worship Radha Krishna in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan because we're performing not uh, we're not worshiping them according to the Ragmarg. I mean there's nothing according to Ragmarg because it's spontaneous <laughs> but we worship according to the Pantratrik Vidhi which means according to the rules and regulations which means it, uh, with on reverence in the mood of Lakshmi Narayan but the point is that these temples that are being established everywhere, they established this kunj for Radha and Krishna. So this is one way, very practical way of looking at it from the point of view of Rupa Goswami and the other Goswamis and their Sadaka Deha. In the spiritual world, the followers of Rupa Goswami are, aspire to be manjaris or assistants to the gopis in their pastimes in which they help to establish, for instance, in the forest they would set up a place where Radha and Krishna would have their pastimes and they would not be disturbed by anyone else and so forth. So this Nikunja Yuno Radike Le Siddhi Yayali Biyotira Pekshaniya. This is the idea. It's there. In our line of devotional service through our disciplic succession, we're aspiring after the same mood of Rupa Goswami as Rupa Manjari. And this is their business in the spiritual world. Does that help? So in the material world, we look at the same thing as, as, um, as how we serve um, our acharyas. We follow their path. And in the process, um, it, is, it is building of temples. Because, uh, yeah, I think I have mm -hmm. to work on it. Around it. Yeah, and, and yeah, in a, as I said, Rupa and Sanatan, they were engaged in some manual labor. As uh, in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it's described how one should not only uh, contemplate the Lord. Anushilanam, shila means to, to cultivate Christian consciousness not only within one's mind, meditating on the Lord's pastimes and so forth, but also to engage in manual labor. The word manual comes from a Latin word which means to use the hands. So that they actually dug up holy places and reestablished these kunjas where Radha and Krishna performed their pastimes, and you can see them even today. As you go through Vrindavan, you'll find these various beautiful little temples that will uh, overwhelm your heart if you go enough times and you're in the right mood and the right light and the mood atmosphere. You'll get an impression that Radha and Krishna are here and they're, they're there performing their pastimes and someone's there serving them and you can come and bring them something also. And now because of the, the heart of Srila Prabhupada, we find these kunjas all over the world. Actually, in the middle of New York City, there's a little kunj, which is a, an embassy from Vrindavan. How is that established? The deity actually manifests out of affection for the pure devotee. Therefore, there's a way in which it's an external show of the heart of the, of the pure devotee when we see these temples and so forth. And what is the mood? It is this nikunjayuno. It's a very intimate idea about the worship of Radha and Krishna. Radha and Krishna are engaged in their most intimate pastimes, as we heard also in the Brahma Sanghita, Sastra Patta Kamalam, Gokulakya Mahatpadam, etc. So, when we hear these uh, uh, words from the 
from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's prayer, we can understand how, yes, by following the disciplic succession, we may now be engaged in, we are now engaged in the sadhana bhakti, which has two parts to it. One is uh, vidhi bhakti and one is raganuga bhakti. That's all within the, the realm of sadhana bhakti of practice. And so we're aspiring for this. Um, and one cannot artificially you know, muster such feelings or imitate them or anything like that, but it is practical that by serving yasya prasada bhagavat prasado yasya prasada nagati kutopi, if one develops this um, dutiful service to the acharyas, then shushu shoshadadhana sya vasudeva kataru chisyan mahatsevayavi prapunya tirtana shavana. There's a way in which one's affinity for hearing about Radha and Krishna awakens within one's heart by um, the mercy of, of these great acharyas. And the idea of this cyclic succession is we're connecting uh, locally to the spiritual masters is then connected and it's like a copper wire. The copper wire, if it's connected, if you touch it anywhere, it will carry the electricity and you'll be able to um, invoke this, uh, you'll be able to awaken, reawaken that uh, potential, the potential, be able to realize the potential that's there within the heart to love uh, Krishna. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhya Kabunoi Shavanadi Shuddha Chite Karu Udoi. Within every little, within every young boy, there's a potential to become attracted to a young girl and vice versa. The potential is there. But just by exposure over in, in the right circumstances, then that, that attraction awakens. So similarly for every soul, there's a, a potential attraction for Krishna. And that through the process of hearing and chanting and serving the acharyas, that becomes realized. It, it actually awakens in a, in a very real way. And then all these verses mean something very more. Uh, they become more and more meaningful because this world, which is a reflection of the spiritual world, actually has variety and so forth. But the real variety, which is what we're always looking for, is there in the spiritual world. And the kind of attraction we find for certain things in this material world is only a, a perverted reflection of our actual attraction for these real things in the spiritual world. And so we're praying for that kind of uh, maturity and devotional service that will come gradually step by step by our association. Okay? Cheto darpana marjanam bhavamaha davagni nirvapanam shreya kairava chandrika vitaranam vidya vadhu jivanam anandam buddhivardanam pratipadam purnam ritasvadanam Sarvadma snapanam param bijayate Shri Krishna sankirtanam nam nam akari bahuda nija sarva shaktis tatra pita niyamitas manane nakalaha etadrishi tava kripa bhagavan mamapi durdaiva midrishami hajani nanuragaha Trinad api suni chena toror api suhishnuna Amanina manadena kirtaniya sadaharihi Nadhanam nadjanam na sundarim kavitam ba jagadisha kamaye Mama janmani janmani shvare pavatad bhakti rahaitu kitwayi Ai nanda tanuja kinkaram patitam mam vishame bhavam budao kripaya tava pada pankaja stita tuli sadrasham bachintaya nayanam galada shudaraya varanam gadgada rudaya gira pulakara nichitam vapukada tava nama grahane bhavishyati Yukayatam nimeshena chakshusha pravrishayatam shunyayatam jagat sarvam govinda virahena me ashlishyava paravratam vinashtumam adarshanan marmahatam korotuva 
Yatatata bhavita tatu lampato ma prana na tasusa eva na paraha ma prana na tasusa eva na paraha ma prana na tasusa eva na paraha what is that number nine prabhura shikshastika shloka j pade shune krishne prema bhakti tara bhade dine dine we'll take it can we see the translations? Oh, no, the, all of them. Thank you very much, Ramananda. Glory to the Sri Krishna Sankirtan, which cleanses the heart of all the dust accumulated for years and extinguishes the fire of conditional life of repeated birth and death. This Sankirtan movement is the prime benediction for humanity at large because it spreads the rays of the benediction moon is a life of all transcendental knowledge. It increases the ocean of transcendental bliss and enables us to fully taste the nectar for which we are always anxious. O oh my Lord, your holy name alone can render all benediction to living beings, and thus you have hundreds and millions of names like Krishna and Govinda. In these transcendental names, you have invested all your transcendental energies they are not even hard and fast rules for chanting these names. O oh my Lord, out of kindness, you enable us to easily approach your holy names. But I am so unfortunate that I have no attraction for them. Once you chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw in the street, one should be more tolerant than the tree, devoid of all sense of false prestige, and should be ready to offer all respects to others. In such a state of mind, one could chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. O oh, Almighty Lord, <coughs> I have no desire to accumulate wealth, nor do I desire beautiful women, nor do I want any number of followers. I only want your causeless devotional service, birth after birth. O Son of Maharajananda Krishna, I am your eternal servitor. Yet somehow or other I have fallen into the ocean of birth and death. Please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. Oh my Lord, when will my eyes be decorated with tears of love flowing constantly when I chant your holy name? When will my voice choke up and when will the hairs of my body stand on end at the recitation of your name? Govinda, feeling your separation, I am constant in a moment to be like 12 years or more. Tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain, and I am feeling all vacant in the world in your absence. I know no one but Krishna as my Lord, and he shall remain so even if he handles me roughly by his embrace, makes me broken hearted by not being present before me. He is completely free to do anything and everything, for he is always my worshipable Lord unconditionally. If anyone recites or hears these eight verses of instruction by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his ecstatic love and devotion for Krishna increase day by day. That's a pretty nice benediction. So today we're talking about how to prepare oneself for, for chanting. This may sound contradictory in a way that because uh, the instruction is kirtaniya sadhari, always chant. But it should be done in the proper state of mind. And especially these shikshashtakam prayers are important to cultivate uh, before chanting the holy name of the Lord. And the mind has a tendency to concoct and therefore in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that the mind is manogatan, which means it's a, it's a mover. It continues all the time in concocting and coming up with ideas for what might be better than what, what I have right now. I may have a, a perfectly get good sweater on, but my mind then says, you know, you need a better one. You need something different, a different color, perhaps a different shade. That's why it's possible for companies to sell every shade of sweater there is, because 
the mind then jumps from one to the next and says, oh, this isn't right for me, I need a different color and so forth. Sadhus typically they pick one color and they stick with it because that way they don't have to think about it so much. Uh, this is the nature of the mind, to, to be restless and want to go from one form of sense gratification to the next. And prajahati yada kaman sarvan parta manogatan atman yeba madaha tushta stita pragnesta docite. But Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that a person who is a stita pragna becomes satisfied in the self. And actually, this is a. Um, an instruction given by Narada Muni to the Prachetas, one of the ways to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead is for oneself, is to oneself cultivate satisfaction. In the, in the face of the concoctions of the mind, which is like a machine that just keeps putting out more and more images for me to examine and say, wouldn't you like this? Wouldn't you like a little different combination or permutation than you have now? Is, uh, stita pragya is as, is uh, satisfied with something different from that, with the, uh, with the experience of being conscious. And so one must uh, have that as a goal in order to come to this position of feeling satisfied. And, and before chanting, uh, Japa, for instance, one must realize that the machine is running. The, that what is that machine? That machine that concocts all kinds of ideas about what I need that I, that I don't have right now in front of me. And because if you don't turn the machine off, or at least uh, observe that it's doing what what its job is, and which is to come up with un, unlimited concoctions for material desires, then while you start to chant, you'll also um, be distracted by these things. And another result can be that if you chant and you also desire these things, then the holy name is called Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha. It fulfills all your desires. So what is the result when you have all these material desires and then you're chanting and think, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Then the unfortunate result of that is that you'll get all those things. And in fact, as we were reading the Brahma Sanhita, the uh, <coughs> personality of Saraswati appears before Brahma. Uvacha purutastasmai tasya divya Saraswati kama krishnaya govinda he gopijani tipi balabhaya prayavan ir mantram te dasati priyam tapas tam tapa etain tapas siddhir bhavishiti. She says that this mantra will fulfill all your desires. And also you can attain perfection by chanting the mantra. And in the purport, uh, the um, Acharya says that the holy name, the mantra itself, it fulfills one's desires. So if you have material desires when you chant, it will help you attain those. And if you want Krishna, then it will help you to develop this proclivity to run after him which is what we're after, to for our mind to actually chase after Krishna. And this is the actual definition of pure devotional service, that upon hearing about him, the mind runs after him. Can you look up the first, please? You know which verse I'm saying? A Kapila Dev. A third canto, it's right after the section where he describes devotional service in the three modes of material nature. And so, uh, Remembering, studying the shikshashtakam every day is an important way to prepare one's mind. It, the shikshashtakam is, is a set of prayers, and by studying them, analyzing them, they're very dense. And there is a commentary by Bhaktivinoda Thakur about the, the prayers, these prayers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's not that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually sat down and wrote these prayers. But um, he, according to the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in ecstasy of remembering Srimati Radharani in the spiritual world, he uttered these various prayers, and they were compiled in this way. You'll see at the very end of the Anjalila, 
how they're, they're put together by Krishnas Kaviraj Goswami. So, Cheto Darpana Marjanam. First of all, we have to realize before we begin chanting that we are cleansing our consciousness. We are cleansing the mirror of the heart. And this must be our goal throughout the day. The bhakti yogis are very careful not to let anything enter into the purview of their, their vision or their uh, hearing that will recontaminate the mirror. And one will then have extra work to do. Because uh, it's, there are many kinds of contaminations that can enter in and then cover the mirror. So cheto darpana marginam, we're aware of the fact as we begin chanting that we're cleansing the mirror of the heart. And bhava maha davagni nirvapanam. This means that the, yeah, actually when I was in Denver, I should get a video of this because I didn't memorize the whole thing. I just watched Adoria Leela Dasi show me one time how they do in their school there. They teach the kids, they memorize all these things. Do you all know this? The, for the, for, and those teaching the kids? Cheto, cheto darpana marjanam, <laughs> bhava mahadavagni nirvapanam, shreya kairava chandrika vitaranam, ayva vidya vidhu. There's a, there's a whole a pantomime that they do. So the kids can actually learn the meanings of each one of the, the words, you know. So this bhava mahadavagni nirvapanam means that there's a way in which I'm burning in this world. In fact, uh, Prabhupada's godbrother, uh, Sridhar Maharaj, once said that it was like a chain smoker, that uh, somebody's smoking a cigarette, and then as soon as it gets burned down to the bottom, they take out a new cigarette, and they light the old one off the new one, the new one off the old one, and then they start smoking in. And in that way, they can stay smoking all day long. So this is samsara. You finish one, the body burns itself out, and then you start another body. It's chain smoking. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's, uh, there's a way that we're burning in this world. Bhava maha davagni nirvapanam. But this chanting process is meant to extinguish this for forest fire of material existence. And uh, what comes in its repla in replacement is this cooling moon of uh, the holy name. And that brings all good fortune. We have no idea in this world what good fortune is because it's uh, a place of reversals. Uh, the, the forest of enjoyment is described in the Srimad Bhagavatam where a, a man thinks, I'll get my uh, <clears throat> fortune in life by going into the forest and there he gets lost and then he's constantly harassed by all kinds of living entities and he suffers dearly in that forest. And uh, whatever appears to be good fortune is actually just a setup for another disappointment in this world. But when actual good fortune comes to a person, uh, he begins to experience this, uh, the, the rays of the moon of good fortune that enter into uh, his or her life, and one begins to, to feel this new stimulation through which we see uh, even those who have so much going for them in the material world, you think, why would they give it up? But the Goswamis of Vrindavan, they considered all these, uh, the wealth they had, the connections they had, the power that they had to be tuchavat, which means insignificant. It becomes insignificant in the light of the reality of the real thing. And uh, so one should be aware when I'm chanting, when I'm beginning to uh, chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, that this is everything. Another, uh, th that is, one's mind should be fixed on one's highest prospect because generally the mind wants so many petty things. Give me this, give me that. But uh, doesn't really consider them carefully. What is the end result of owning these kinds of things of, or actually obtaining them? What will really happen when I get them? It's like a little child doesn't care just wants to grab everything, and, and this one, that one, this one, that one, this one, and put it in its mouth, and uh, doesn't consider what's good or bad for him or her. So the mind is like that. So we should fi fix our prospect 
fix the idea of what is our highest prospect in life before we start chanting and realize that by this chanting process, uh, with uh, attention, attentive chanting, I'll come to the highest position of life. I will cleanse the mirror of the heart. I will extinguish the fire of material existence. I will then also uh, be bathed in the moonshine of, of, of the great moon of good fortune. And the white lotus uh, <laughs> of fortune will open in my life. So all these things, the mind when it believes, when it cultivates these ideas and understands that all these things are possible just by chanting the holy name of the Lord, will then be attentive. So this is a very important point. In order to be attentive, we have to know what's in it for me. In other words, you can be sitting in a crowded room and you hear so many voices talking and it's, it's just a, a cacophony, it's just a din, but it's nothing very interesting until over way in the corner you might hear someone say your name. They're talking about me and then immediately what do we, you tune out everything, the conversation you're talking here, all the other voices and you can hear very distinctly now all the way in the corner, what are they saying about me? Because ultimately as Shukadev Goswami says in the 10th canto when he's speaking to Prikshit Maharaj about uh, Krishna's pastime of, the, of Brahma stealing away the boys and calves that Everyone wants to know one thing, what do I get out of this? <laughs> What's in it for me? Everyone's self-interested in this world. So if we understand, if we cultivate this idea of my highest good is available through chanting of the holy name, if I have a firm belief in this, then the mind may cooperate. Then you can, through intelligence, convince the mind, don't run away, stay for this. You're going to get something out of it. This is an important aspect of paying attention while one is praying, especially praying through chanting, the, through the repetition of the Hare Krishna mantra. We're repeating God's name over and over again after all. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare. And this actually connects us directly to the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly. There's no separation at, at all. For those who enter into the chanting with this clear understanding of, of what it is and what's ben, what one's benefit is from chanting the holy name. So Mahabrabhu begins in his Shikshashtakam with giving this, it's benefits-based marketing. He begins by telling us, what are all the benefits? Cheto dharpana marjanam bhavamaha davagni nirvapanam shreya kairava chandri kavitaranam vidya vidhu vidya vidhu jivanam. You'll get all knowledge from this also. Don't think that by chanting you're missing anything else. It's the wife of transcendental knowledge. She's right there. So you chant Hare Krishna, you can't be without knowledge and everything else. All opulence is, is available through chanting the holy name. Vidya vidhu jivanam. Uh, Anandam buddhivardhanam, what we're always anxious for, that happiness, it's in the holy name. Believe it, cultivate it. You have to hear it over and over again because then the mind the next day will say, no, no, it's somewhere else. Let's look, around the, let's look around a junk pile and see if we can find some scrap there. But again, this, these prayers are meant to bring us back to understand it's there, it's there, it's there. Believe it, look for it, search for it, keep focused on, on the chanting. It's there within the holy name itself. Uh, pratipadam, purnam rita svadhanam, sarvatma snapanam param vijayate. My godbrother was once telling me, he was very vigilant. I saw him every day when I visit him. Uh, he's in uh, Bangkok when I was passing through. I'd stay at his home. Very serious about chanting his, his rounds every day. He would get up, take his bath, and sit down in front of his deities. And he would just sit there the whole time and chant his 16 rounds very methodically. And uh, he was telling me his experiences with chanting Hare Krishna. It's nice to talk to other devotees. What is your experience of chanting Hare Krishna? And he would say sometimes he has this taste when he's chanting. And other times he said nothing, nothing coming at all. And then he said like one day he was, ch he chanted his 16 rounds and he was thinking, why? I can't have anything. And then he, he he finished his morning duties, uh, went out of the, his little temple room in his house, and then he was uh, putting some laundry in the little, you know, Asian washing machine. 
Uh, and, um, <laughs> and then uh, he said right when he stepped out onto the veranda and he was putting laundry in the washing machine, immediately he felt, he looked at the world as completely different. He felt this happiness and detachment, a satisfaction. And he realized then it's all there. Sometimes you realize it right away, other t you'll realize it later on. And if we, if we had the commentary of the, oh, I do on my laptop. Anyway, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur talks about the holy name in the sixth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam in relationship to Ajamil. And he said the holy name will manifest his uh, munificence in due course of time according to his own schedule. Don't try to rush it. It's just like a fruit on a tree, he said. When you grow a tree, it takes its time. And it takes a, a while for, you've got to put it in the ground, you've got to wait some f for a few seasons, a few seasons before, uh, and then the fruit comes out. And it doesn't come out all juicy right away. It comes as a little tiny, first a flower, and then a little tiny, whatever it is, a little tiny, little round thing. <laughs> and then it starts to grow and it takes some time with the sun and the rain and all the air and it, all the, you know, everything all put together hanging on the tree for so long and then it becomes ripe. And so when we're chanting we also have to realize that there's, there's a, a period of time we have to be patient for and the Holy Name can come at any time. And in fact, in that commentary, Vishnath Chakravarti Thakur says, the Lord manifests his uh, munificence through the holy name in the life of the devotee in his own time scale, and he has different motives for doing that. It's all for the good of the devotee, but sometimes he withholds it for some time. Others, sometimes people get, some get, get it quicker than others, but sometimes he withholds it to the very end of their life, in fact. So don't, don't give up. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay. You know, <laughs> you got to wait. Uh, for the holy name. So you have to be patient and uh, that requires reminding oneself over and over again that uh, this is all available for the whole holy name. When you get medicine from the doctor you may not experience the uh, improvement. You may not feel any improvement right away. But if you have faith in the doctor because he's treated many other people. So you get these recommendations for a doctor. It's a, you know, so many people told you, no, I went to, oh, it's fantastic, you know, he cured me. It's like, because there's always some, suspect, there's always some skepticism in going to a doctor that this isn't going to work. And then everyone says, ah, you know, that stuff doesn't work. That's quackery, you know. You're, ne you're not going to get anything going to a doctor. And everyone has their own cure, and their own doctor, and so forth. But if, if you're fortunate enough to find a good doctor and you hear the recommendations over and over again, so many people he's cured, and then at least you can have a little faith in the doctor and say, okay, I'm going to try because he's cured so many people. He's got a diploma on his wall. He's got a nice office. He, you know, he doesn't smoke. There's so many things. And then you go in and, and take the cure. But then you have to be patient and you have to keep taking it and understand that this is my only hope. So we get a prescription for the holy name. And in this prescription, at the beginning, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was mercifully telling us all the things, the benefits that are going to come from chanting uh, Hare Krishna. So cultivate those. Remember what they are. What is the benefit of having a, a cleansed heart and extinguishing the forest fire of material existence? Nothing else will do that. And how does one come to uh, be associated with the wife of all transcendental knowledge through this chanting. The, light, the white lotus of good fortune opens in one's life. Everyone wants that. Everyone's praying in that way. So remember these things constantly. Cultivate them. And then comes the next verse, which is that uh, the Lord's name has personal shaktis. And while chanting Hare Krishna, we can remember that there's a nidja sarva shakti. It's the, God, it's the Lord's personal shakti is there. So we're connecting directly to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in a very intimate way through saying his name over and over again. In fact, I was reading recently how in uh, previous ages, although the, uh, the great sages knew the efficacy of the holy name, they were afraid to chant it because of making offenses, because of letting their mind wander and thinking, that uh, 
you know, there's something else more valuable. And then how offensive is that? that? The holy name is personally present on my tongue. I'm saying the holy name is like, nah, go watch television. Or whatever it is, even back then when there was no television and there were sages sitting in the forest, they were afraid of subtly offending the holy name by not being present because Nija Sarva Shakti is fully present here. And you could just think, ah, it's nothing, and then walk away. And what an offense that is. It's the root cause of all offenses, according to Bhaktivinoda Thakur, this inattention. Like, here's the holy name. Meh. 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 Not interested. So they were reluctant to engage in that direct process. But in the age of Kali Yuga, it's such a severe situation and, uh, that now Mahaprabhu comes and he says, okay, here's the really strong medicine, we're bringing it out, and I'm going to protect you because now in this age you have to have this strong medicine. <laughs> you're so fallen you're going to be distracted every which way. You take this now. You take this holy name now. And in the age of Kali, it's the only thing that will save you in the age of Kali Yuga. So he's bringing out this point. Nam, nam, akari, bahuda, nijasarva shakti. It's all in there. All the powers of the holy name. There's so many names that can attract your mind just as there are so many colors of sweaters you can be attracted to. Okay, so there's millions of names of, of Krishna. Uh, you can go through them all and, and become attracted to these different names. But then he says that I'm so unfortunate that even though this is the strongest process, even though it's been brought directly by Mahaprabhu in order to save us, and give us a dispensation that your only qualification in the age of Kali is that you're so unqualified we have to give, bring the heavy medicine and we're not going to consider any, any, any of your offenses. Uh, that I'm so unfortunate. Durdaiva means just like I'm star-crossed. Durdaiva means there's, uh, the demigods are, are messing with my head so I can't be uh, attracted to this. Somehow or other, something's uh, gone haywire in my mind, and, and I can't take this. I can't even take the medicine. So what am I going to do? So that comes out in the next uh, verse, which is here's, here's how to solve that situation. You have, you have to do this, at least this, in order to be able to have traction in your chanting, and that is you have to consider yourself uh, and this is according to the reality of the situation, come, come to your senses for a moment and consider the reality that you're as low as the grass and that uh, you should cultivate this and you should also feel that uh, yourself to be very tolerant like a tree. Tolerate. So I was reading a, um, uh, another devotee named Shraddha who's a disciple of... Um, What's his name? The great scholar who write, writes all these books in his con. I mean, uh, he was in Philadelphia and now he just moved to Washington, D.C. Bhakti, uh, Rabindra Sarup Prabhu is a disciple, Shraddha, who's, who's his secretary. You know, she picked out and put on her blog this article written by a, um, a monk in the Catholic Church. And he was talking about how... Um, he was talking about not taking for granted what you have. Oh, and tolerating that you may be in an institution that people are doing things you don't like and so forth, but still you have to learn tolerance. <laughs> that even, even though you're in an in a institution meant for glorifying God and making advancement in devotional service, there's a way in which you can become uh, challenged in so many different ways. People are always, always got different ideas, always conflicts and so forth, so you have to be tolerant. And... Uh, so you have to learn tolerance and then also practice this point in your mana moha jitta sangha dosha adhyatma nitya vinivritti kama tvanvarva mukta sukatuka samjar kachantya muda param avyayam tat. This is a prescription. It's written on a little doctor's pad in, in triplicate and say, here, there's powerful stuff here. You take this, you take this medicine now, trinadapi suni chena, nirmana moha jitta sangha dosha. Don't get puffed up. Don't get puffed up. Don't, uh, don't be intolerant. Practice this tolerance and be, be ready all the time. This is your medicine. Be ready all, all the time to give respect to others 
and don't take respect for yourself. It's poisonous. It destroys the, the ability of one to really call out to the holy name and to get what we're really looking for, which is sanctuary at the lotus feet of, of the Lord. Real sanctuary only comes through sincerity. I was thinking the other day about um, how fast life is moving. Someone called me and said, uh, one of Nirkula's uh, brother's daughters is graduating from college I couldn't believe it because I just she I mean, it just seemed like two days ago there they were at her house and she was a little baby screaming in our house and um, <laughs> screaming at me uh, and now graduating from college and, and, and I just see how things are zipping by you know the whole life zipping by and everything moving you can't uh, you can't hold on to any, anything it's, it goes it just goes away by its own power moves on its own power we don't have any control over it and uh, there's one thing, there's only one thing that actually uh, holds its own in, in all this movement, it's sincerity. It's the one f uh, focal point, it's the one thing you can hold on, it's the one thing that's really yours, that, that nobody can take away, nobody can, it can't be changed by anything, it, it's your, your own sincerity, which is a, 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 the freedom Krishna has given you to use your, um, your will to... Um, and turn your attention towards him, with sincerity, and to um, freely acknowledge your dependence on him and so forth. Submissiveness, submissiveness, sincerity, these are all, all the, the greatest ornaments of a living entity. One who has these, these ornaments can go anywhere at any time, any place and be welcomed actually. Because everyone else is at conflict is in conflict with uh, every other living being because everyone wants to be recognized. And if you're not, will, if you're not eager in being recognized, immediately everyone notices it. Oh, okay, <laughs> this person's okay. <laughs> they can come in. Everyone else like, hey, you sit over there. We're going to watch you for a while. We will make sure you're not going to take our position and so forth. So uh, one can overcome this durdaivam, this unfortunate situation in life, by being, uh, by practicing these points of, of being, feeling oneself lowly, of being very tolerant. And uh, that also, it's just, this is the most uh, satisfying of practices, and that is the very practice of uh, being satisfied. You can observe it on a moment to moment basis because the mind will always be spinning and grabbing out for more things. I was just noticing it because uh, I read this verse about satisfaction and I really love this concept of uh, how you can please the Lord by being satisfied. Be satisfied, Krishna says, yadrisha labasantushto, of gain that comes its own, of its own accord. So it's like the mind says, I want this, you gotta go to the store, you gotta get it on Amazon.com, you gotta do a, get, get a credit card, you gotta get a newer credit card, you gotta, you gotta get something. And it's like, why do I gotta get anything? I just be satisfied. That'll solve all the problems right there. I don't have to go anywhere and have to get a new credit card. How about if I'm just satisfied with gain that comes of his own accord? Just let the game come to you. Let it come. And then be satisfied with what you already have, which is so significant that uh, if one can realize that, one doesn't actually have to go anywhere or do anything. In fact, one isolates oneself from all these, the barrage of desires and, and other kinds of uh, sense objects that can come into one's pur purview, uh, one becomes uh, resistant to actually letting the mind out to, to entertain them because he knows that starts a whole suite of other um, possible implications that will take me down a road that, that will leave me stranded. And as Shankaracharya writes in one of his prayers to Lord Narsingadev, and the, the highwaymen of my senses. Don't you hate highwaymen? Did you ever meet any? You get held up. When I was a kid, my parents used to take us down to Mexico for Easter vacation. We had a pile in our, in our Volkswagen microbus because my parents were good, uh, you know, intellectual academics, so they had to have a microbus. And that so we get in our, our Volkswagen microbus and we drive down to Mexico. We were through Mexico. I remember one time we got stopped on the road. We were in the middle of nowhere, which is really dangerous, actually, driving with your kids through Mexico. I was like, what were you guys thinking? <laughs> and 
were you trying to kill us or what? <laughs> you know, we got stopped by this guy with a gun and the other guy with a sword, and you know, we had to pay him off, and then we went on. We didn't get killed or anything like that, but it's like highwaymen, they're just waiting there. You never know when they're going to rob you. And in India, too, we said during uh, Kartik, it hasn't happened recently from what I know, but about 10 years ago, I remember some devotees were leaving Radhakund on Bahulashmi, where a million people come to bathe in a, you know, a pond that's about twice as big as this temple room all at one time. And so then, um, you know, on the way home at 1 o'clock in the morning and stuff like that, uh, these highwaymen, they'll put it, this is interesting, you're going to go like this, about highwaymen. They put a log in the middle of the road, and then, you know, you, you're just driving in the dark in some crummy ambassador car or something like that 10 years ago. And then, you know, you have to come to a uh, squealing, screeching halt with the crummy brakes and the tires with no treads. And then, you know, out from the bushes come all these guys with guns. And they, they you know, they shot in the window. They hurt some of the devotees. They took all their money. And, you know, they tried to get away. And it was a big, you know traumatic experience. So Shankaracharya said that the highwaymen of my senses, they, they grab me, they rob me, they throw me into a, a pit and I'm just stranded down there. So uh, devotees are very careful about this. They're, they're, this verse helps protect us, this prescription. Take this prescription home. Don't, be, uh, don't go down these roads where the highwaymen are lurking. The roads of the senses. Senses, hey, come down here. This is going to be really interesting. No, it's not. It's not, first of all, it's not going to be interesting. Punak punas charvita charvananam. Prahlad Maharaj says, it's not interesting. Uh, tell your mind. This, I'm not interested because it's not interesting. It's all been done before. <laughs> I did this. I went there before, and it's not interesting. <laughs> That's Maya's trick. He says, it's interesting. No, it's not interesting. Not interesting at all. There's something much more interesting. What was that? Been there, done that. It's all been done and more. Hansa Priya? Yeah, the invisible hook for the fish. And I was telling at Google the other day, some of the people had heard of Charlie Brown. Have you heard of Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown was a, a Peanuts. You ever heard of Peanuts, the comic strip? Charlie Brown is the, is the uh, hero, so to speak, the anti-hero of the, of, of the comic called Peanuts. And one of the scenes in that that I described the other day at Google, which some people had heard of, because you can relate to this. It's, it's me. You know, hey, that's me. That's why people like Charlie Brown. It's like Lucy, who's his nemesis, she always brings the football, an American football, and, uh, and then puts it in. Part of football is, you know, someone holds the football and then you have to kick it, right? And so, you know, she'd come out and hold the football and say, Charlie Brown, come kick the football. And then Charlie Brown goes, no, I remember last time, as soon as I came to kick the football, you pulled it out and I landed on my head. He said, not this time, Charlie Brown. And then so he goes, okay, and he finally get his courage up and he come running to kick the football and then she always pull it out. Lucy was like that. That's just what she does, you know. And so that's what Maya does too. Maya's like, come here, come here, come on. No, try it again, you know. It's like, okay, all right, all right. This time it's like, whew, boom, right on the head. So, uh, you know, for one to, those who are engaged in this process of bhakti, the sincere prayers, they cultivate this idea, there's nowhere else to go. I have no other refuge except for you. And uh, this is medicine. This verse 3 is the medicine. It's the medicine. In fact, it's mentioned in the Chaitanya Charnamrita that by Kaviraj Goswami that one should wear this around one's neck. You have to make a garland of it. So, on the way home, you have to stop at, <laughs> what's the name of the place? Michael's? Okay, go to Michael's, or if you have the yarn barn. There is no yarn barn, but if there was one, you could go there too. And you could get some thread. You've got to get your own thread. Go to Michael's, get yourself some thread, and then string this as a garland when you get home. And look at the jewels that are in this verse. These are each jewels that will actually make you wealthy counterintuitive to the materialistic mind that wealth comes from working hard. No, it doesn't. Lots of people work hard and they don't get anything except for, you know, more work. And their boss takes away some of their colleagues and says, okay, you're fired, you're fired, but you do all their work for them, right? <laughs> That's what you really get in the material world. You don't get anything really. And then, so these are the real uh, jewels of life, Vishaka. 
I just remembered this quote uh, that I heard from Raghunath Maharaj. He was saying that um, estimate how rich you are by counting the number of things that you have that money cannot buy. Oh, that's perfect. Estimate how rich you are by how many things you have that money cannot buy. Yes, Sundar Ananda Prabhu. Uh, I have a question, Prabhu. Yes. So, um, first of all, I mean, uh, we have heard, um, at least I have heard uh, this was so many times, but uh, this particular mood doesn't seem so uh, natural in the sense that it doesn't um, seem to come very naturally. And uh, my uh, second part of the question is... Uh, What's the question? I mean, That's a statement, that question. <laughs> so what should we do to... Uh, you know, are there things that we can consciously do to uh, imbibe this particular mood? Well, one thing is get around people who can straighten you out. That really helps. If you get around a crowd, an easy crowd, uh, or a, a crowd that's not interested in this, then you may not be so inclined. But if you can get around somebody who will straighten you out regularly, it really helps. It's, it's the fast way to come to this feeling of I'm really low, is to get chastised by somebody you really respect. And you can see they're advanced. If they, if they say something to you heavy, then really quickly, you can feel Trinata Pisinichi not, and how beneficial it is. Because as soon as you get chastised, then you can feel like, wow, I'm really lowly, it's really hard to take, but then you feel like, wow, I can really chant now. So try to get chastised, you know. <laughs> and really that's, what, you know, it, that's why you seek, you know, such association is to, to really, you know, get that. That's really something that you can do that's practical. Also by thinking of gratitude generally. Doing? Gratitude? Generosity. Write a gratitude journal? Yeah, that helps because, um, I mean, if you honestly write, then um, we understand our position. And uh, when we offer gratitude, we, we are able to appreciate the presence of Lord and the devotees in our life. That helps us to. So, what stay thing would humble. you put on your gratitude journal today? I didn't write. I mean, I don't write regularly, but in the past, whenever I. What I've thing been, would you put today? Uh, yeah, if I write today, I would put. Um, I would basically um, count the, the fortunes in my life in the well, sense. Give us that, one. Like the association in the temple hearing from you. <laughs> okay. Hare <laughs> Krishna. So, um, that's a nice point. A gratitude journal. Think of very specific things you're grateful for. Yes. Yeah, I mean, in the course of our um, conversation, I also uh, realized that uh, many times Krishna also reveals our shortcomings and um, when we are chanting and uh, doing devotional service, suddenly it hits you that, you know, I have a lot of shortcomings. I think that also brings out that particular mood. Is Seeing your own shortcomings. shortcomings. Yeah, that's helpful. And uh, one more uh, question I had was, Prabhu, um, is this um, a particular effect of our sadhana or it's consciously cultivated and it... Well, you have to think what sadhana is. Sadhana is not mechanical. And that's partly the purpose of this topic is that our sadhana, our practice, is, it shouldn't be mechanical. We should really carefully observe. In the, in the Shastra, it's described the, the practice of manana. Manana means to look very carefully. This was last weekend when I was with uh, Tushta Prabhu and Vrinda Sundari, they were talking about how they had just read Sachinandan Swami's book in this section about manana, which is self-observation. You have to look very carefully take time to, it's different from prayer, it's a kind of looking at your own consciousness and seeing what's really in there. And, um, and looking at with, a, with a view to uh, spotting offenses. And you'll see in the prayers of <clears throat> Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Amara Jivana, he, he's talking about his faults 
that I'm a very fallen, li lowly living entity, that I, I have this envy burning in my heart. I'm always averse to topics about the personality of God and so forth. Just R Raghunath Das Goswami also, he writes in the Manakshiksha, a prayer to the mind, but it's a kind, of, kind of a manana, where he's observing his, the state of his consciousness and he's saying what's really in there and being very careful to uh, note all the subtle th aversions he has to the holy name and so forth and to other devotees and to devotional service and the offenses that he's committed and so forth. And this kind of observation is the real sadhana. If we just practice without thinking about what I'm doing and so forth, then uh, as the Chaitanya Charnamrita says, Kaviraj Goswami says, you can chant for millions of years in an offensive way if you don't take time to observe yourself and, and how your consciousness is actually situated. But if you're careful, then if you're observant, then you, and you try to rectify it in a practical way, then you'll, you'll make progress. You'll actually make progress, yes. Oh, go ahead and then Pratibha. Yeah. So this is regarding your comment, Prabhu, where you said uh, don't be puffed up and you know, don't be intolerant, right? So a recent event uh, that happened, I could relate to this, you know, comment, for example, Donald Sterling, right, if you know who he is, right? He had like everything going on and then within like 48 hours, the tables have turned on him. So it's very important that, you know, you be grounded, uh, in, especially in profession or whatever you do. So, yeah. thank you. That's true, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, like you were mentioning about Manana, so, and when last time when Giraj Maharaj was here, I had asked a question that uh, how, when we progress, why do we get the disappointment that the more I progress, the more I feel that, uh, no, I'm falling behind, I have so much far to go, how am I going to do, this, do, do it in this lifetime? But somehow or the other, like either you read something or you hear some lecture and one word will be a ray of light for you in that phase of disappointment when we are going through our crest and throws, even our spiritual life that you would feel that, uh, oh yes, this is it, I'm in the right path. And as long as that's the case, then what is, like you say it, like what is the value of a million lifetimes in eternity? So. Yeah, nice point. And we need encouragement. And also, we could consider, we should consider, and it's a fact, we're eternally students. It's not that, that I come to a point and I say, uh, now I'm good, I've, I've made it. In fact, the moment one thinks, oh, I'm, I'm perfect, I'm pure, then, as Prabhupada said, one's a rascal. Kiri Rashmar said that also, said <laughs> this is the sign of a rascal. I'm a pure devotee, you're a rascal. A pure devotee's <laughs> thinking, I'm so fallen, I'm unworthy. Even Prabhupada says, Srimati Radharani is thinking like that. What is my qualification to approach Krishna? Mm -hmm. And so there, there's this, you know, eternal quest for uh, refinement, which is the most worthy and interesting of all occupations, <coughs> trying to improve one's service. There's never a, a point at which I say I'm done. As my Madanga teacher says, as soon as you think that you're finished, you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. You're not here. <laughs> you're, now you're really bad. You know, it's like you be sa if you're satisfied with where you're at now, then there's no hope for you. you you're not going to improve from there. So this kind of uh, it's a, simultaneously you have to be dissatisfied and satisfied at the same time. Because if you get too dissatisfied and become despondent and think, oh, I can't do this, I'm so fallen. Some people say, I'm not chanting. Why? I'm too fallen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact. A lot of, and the mind can convince us of this. People even kill themselves. It's like, oh, you know, you got a perfectly good human body and so many things, the mind will say, you know, like, you're no good. Kill yourself. And it's like, all right. That's not a good idea. Don't, uh, don't do that and don't give up your practice. But at the same time, you know, you should, we should be very observant of what our internal state is and see how can I refine it. Gurmash, the mind which you were talking in the initial part of the lecture when you started, you said that the mind distracts us constantly. So we should notice this and switch off the box. I have a basic question on the mind. The mind is one of the so many... Um, we count them, right? The earth and then subtle body. And God creates the mind. It, what it, is what? The mind is what one of those elements that, that God creates. Uh -huh. Is that correct? Or, because um, I was wondering, 
if the mind by its nature was constantly contemplating on on all the diverse options that I'm being that are available I'm always thinking about what else can I do what writing is this the natural state of the mind well the mind can be the best friend or the worst enemy Krishna says in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita so the mind that's addicted to sense gratification is the worst enemy but the mind and can I have that verse that becomes attracted to hearing about Krishna becomes the best friend. So by, so, na by nature it is diverse, it's always searching? Well, the mind is, a, is an instrument and it's like a reflective surface, like a mirror. That's why it's described as a mirror, darpanam. And, and so, oh the, no, I mean the uh, Bhagavatam, sorry. That one's probably good too. The mind's a, ref a f reflective surface. And so when it's distorted because of contamination by the three modes of material nature, you have ignorance that affects the mind in a certain way. And you can read in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita about how the mind, which is affected by various modes, it, it reacts in different ways. Like one's determination, which comes from the mind, is uh, affected by uh, ignorance and that one's determination is dreaming. I'm thinking about doing it. People who smoke uh, ganja, that this is how they think. It's like, yeah, someday I'm going to start a business. And it's like, that was 20, you said that 20 years ago. It's like, I know, but you know, it's like, I'm thinking someday I should do it. And then, the mode, then there's the mode of passion, and then the mode of goodness. <laughs> it, it, the mind, the reflective surface is, is affected by these modes. It's colored in different ways. So it, it reflects our consciousness. In, in various ways. But when the mind is clear, then we can see our clear consciousness, which is part and parcel of Krishna. So the mind has to be cleansed. Even if the mind is cleansed, what I'm trying to understand is, is the mind still going to be looking for ways to serve Krishna like it did for the material option? Then when it becomes your friend, then it becomes attracted to serving Krishna, yeah. So it will think of multitude of ideas, it will keep throwing up things. And it will think of all kinds of ways to, you know, and it's all related to Krishna, right. So the mind is a material instrument, actually. And according to Sankhya, it's counted in all the elements, right? So it, it's, a, it's an external feature of the material energy, but it's, it's part of the apparatus we have, but it can be purified. And then, Iha yasya harer dasye karmana manasa gira nikila apyavastas tu jivan mukta su uchite. One can be a, a liberated soul even while living in the body, even with the mind, because it becomes purified. And this verse, which Mukharavind Prabhu pulled out, and this is not it, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Let's see. No, that's not it. No. I mean, I do want the Gita, but not right now. Um, <laughs> can you find the verse that is... It, it describes, he's describing the, the three, sorry, I can't remember it right now. He's describing, what is it? He describes devotional service in three modes of material nature. There's devotional service in ignorance, passion, goodness, and then transcendence. And then he describes what is the nature of that. Okay, so this is, this is one point I wanted to bring up, how important the Shikshashtaka prayers are. And they only get deeper and deeper. Every day one can study these, and, but go into them. Don't just say it. Like, if you go to some uh, assemblies, you know, after the morning program, that's okay. But go into the prayers and see what's actually in there. What does it mean to you? How can you use it? to uh, come closer to Krishna and chanting the holy name. Look at these things, they're, they're given, they're perfect. They are perfect and they are fully useful, but you really have to use them and that's real sadhana. Take them very seriously and find out what's in it for me spiritually to make advancement in my sadhana. And then, yeah, that's true to, okay, this is it. So this, this verse describes, this is from 329, 11 through 12. This is a very important verse which is uh, given, which is quoted by uh, Rupa Goswami and the other, other acharyas describing what is the state of the mind when, when it becomes purified. And you can see this for yourself. This is why it's so important. If you're operating this machinery and you're a, a sincere sadhaka, you must 
understand what are the symptoms of, of your advancement or not. And the verse says, Madguda shuti matrina mai sarva guhashaye manogatir avichchina yata gangam basom budao lakshanam bhakti yogasya nirgunasya hudaritam ahaituki avyavahita ya bhakti purushotame. The manifestation of unadulterated devotional service is exhibited when one's mind is at once attracted to hearing the transcendental name and qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is residing in everyone's heart. Just as the water of the Ganges flows naturally down toward the ocean, such devotional ecstasy, uninterrupted by any material condition, flows toward the Supreme Lord. While I'm reading the purport to this, could you please get me 42031? Here's the purport. The basic principle of this unadulterated pure devotional service is love of Godhead. Madguna Shuti Matrena means just after hearing about the transcendental qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And bring over a nectar devotion while you're at it too, please. These qualities are called Nirguna. The Supreme Lord is uncontaminated by the modes of material nature, therefore he is attractive to the pure devotee. There is no need to practice meditation to attain such attraction. The pure devotee is already in the transcendental stage and the affinity between him and the Supreme Personality of God it is natural and is compared to the Ganges water flowing toward the sea. The flow of the Ganges water cannot be stopped by any condition. Similarly, a pure devotee's attraction for the transcendental name, form, and pastimes of the Supreme Godhead cannot be stopped by any material condition. The word avichchina, without interruptions, is very important in this connection. No material condition can stop the flow of devotional service of the pure devotee. The word ahetuki means without reason. Thank you, sir. A pure devotee does not render loving service to the personality of God for any cause or for any benefit, material or spiritual. This is the first symptom of unalloyed devotion. Anyabilashita shunyam, he has no desire to fulfill by rendering devotional service. Such devotional service is meant for the Purushottam, the Supreme Personality, and not for anyone else. Sometimes pseudo-devotees show devotion to many demigods, thinking the forms of the demigods to be the same as the Supreme Personality of Godhead's form. It is specifically mentioned herein, however, that bhakti, devotional service, is meant only for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan, Vishnu, or Krishna, not for anyone else. Avyavahita means without cessation. A pure devotee must engage in the service of the Lord 24 hours a day without cessation. His life is so molded that at every minute and every second he engages in some sort of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Another meaning of the word avyavahita is that the interest of the devotee and the interest of the Supreme Lord are on the same level. The devotee has no interest but to fulfill the transcendental desire of the Supreme Lord. Such spontaneous service unto the Supreme Lord is transcendental and never contaminated by the material modes of nature. These are the symptoms of pure devotional service which is free from all contamination of material nature. So uh, this is the Cheto Darpana Marginum symptom. And as you become purified in your practice of devotional service, you can see for yourself how I'm interested in Krishna Kata. If you start to have a hankering to hear Krishna Kata, you'll, you'll, this is a sign of spiritual health that, uh, that is very relishable because then you don't have any other, any other obligations. You know uh, the knowledge comes with it that uh, this is everything to me. This hearing of Krishna Kata contains everything. It is everything. It's fully satisfying. I don't need to go anywhere. I don't need to do anything else. And there's full satisfaction in that. And so, as we're improving in our spiritual health, tada rajas tamo bhava kama loba dayaschaye cheta itera navidham sthitam sattve prasiditi. One becomes situated in sattvagun and then starts to feel the transcendence breaking through that one is actually interested in hearing about uh, the qualities of Lord Hari. 
Itam Buddha Guno Harihi. His qualities become very interesting to the mind. And not just interesting, then fascinating. Fascinating means that you're fastened to something. That's what fascinating means. You're connected to it intimately. And then you develop an affinity, which just means there, there's like this loving affection for it. This connection, you, you feel one with it and so forth. So measure by uh, this means primarily how much you're advancing in devotional service and try to cultivate this through purifying the mind and intelligence. Now, as far as preparing oneself for chanting, there are various prayers which are important. And here's a prayer which is by <coughs> Pritu Maharaj on uh, 4.20.31, which I will recommend as a prescription. Try this prayer, print it out, Say it before you begin chanting, memorize it, and think about it very deeply before you chant the holy names. And you'll see a, 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 an immediate difference in the way you're thinking about your chanting when you, when you begin to chant Hare Krishna. And the verse says, My dear Lord, due to your illusory energy, all living beings in this material world have forgotten their real constitutional position and out of ignorance, they are always desirous of material happiness in the form of society, friendship, and love. Therefore, please do not ask me to take some material benefits from you. But as a father, but as a father, not waiting for the son's demand, does everything for the benefit of the son, please bestow upon me whatever you think best for me. Whatever you think best for me. Samahitum means please act on my behalf. So this is a kind of permission giving to the Lord that I don't know what's right for me. Uh, I'm only interested in bad things. Let's just take that for granted. I'm an illusion. And whatever I ask for is wrong. And someone the other day wrote me a letter uh, making so many plans, so many plans. And she analyzed in her letter, she said, I realize now that none of my plans have ever worked out. <laughs> So, so he's saying, I'm thinking about taking a different course in life. I'm taking the, you know, a higher instruction. Let me try a different way. What's best for me spiritually? I'll take that plan. And so that should be our focus, how to find that. Other plans don't work out. You're not going to be successful making a plan. No one ever has. It's zero to a trillion to the trillionth power in the material world that... Everyone's failed in their plans here in the material world. So don't think, well, I'm going to be the one who's successful. This is the optimism of the mind that keeps one in the material world. It's like, I'll, I'll be successful. Even though everyone else has been defeated, I'll, I'll be the one who makes it. This is the little jiva against material nature. And Krishna says to remind us, daivahiyesha gunamayi mama maya duratyaya. It's too much trouble. Please don't try for this. It's too much, too much uh, strain on you to, to fight against the material nature. Just give up and take my plan. Prabhadyante, surrender into my plan and take my, my system. He said, then it's very easy. Then life's very easy if you take my plan. No problem that way. So the, this prayer by Prithu Maharaj is something you, you can integrate into your practice and just say, my Lord, I don't know what's good for me. You know what's good for me. Therefore, I'm going to chant with an open heart, and you please show me, and I'll take it. This is sincerity, and this will protect one in any situation in the material world. It's, it's our constitutional position. And when, when, when we act in our constitutional position, we're like a fish that goes back in the water. And the fish on the land, you can give him a credit card. <laughs> you can give him a... A Facebook. <laughs> Yikes. You can give him a, uh, a car. I don't know. What else can you get in these days? Is there anything that's actually you can get anymore? Can you get anything anymore? What else can you get? You can get a house. Give the fish a house. And you can give him a, huh? Give the fish an iPad. Give, him a, give fish a little fish Google Glass. But... 
If fish are happy when you put them in the water. They're so happy. You just drop them in and it's like, okay, I'm a fish. I like the water. So the soul likes uh, to be in this constitutional position. It's Krishna, it's up to you. I'm surrendered to you. Manasa deho geho yo kichu more. That my mind, my body, my home, myself that belongs to you. Just give it up and say yourself that belongs to you. This is the process of what's called sweet surrender. What's sweet about it? It's just nectar. You just flow into the, into the land of Krishna, I'm yours. And I don't have any other agenda in this world except your agenda. And then what do I have to worry about? I got, I'm, you're backing me up. And I'm, I'm whatever goes. And I heard the other day, Prabhupada was talking about if you surrender to Krishna's plan and saying, I'm just working for you, then if things go wrong, it's, that's Krishna's. <laughs> Of course, we don't, he also clarified other times that you don't botch things because of being lazy or inattentive and then say, oh, Krishna's mercy, that's his. You take it on your head. But Prabhupada was pointing out this very important thing, that, that if you're surrendered to Krishna, whatever way it goes, you know, if you sincerely gave yourself to that plan of Krishna's and your spiritual master, then the result, that's, that's not yours. You're not worried about it. So try this prayer. And this will prepare your mind in a very powerful way for uh, chanting Hare Krishna. And may I have the first canto of the Bhagavatam. I'll take Queen Kunti, Jan Mai Shraya, Shruta Shri Bir, Edamana Madapuman. Hansa Priya. Manasa Deho Geho, Yo Kichumor. Arpilun tu apare nahit shior. Yes, uh, Hari Vamsha, and then up to Vital. Um, as you were uh, talking about the plans, I, I was just hearing in a lecture and uh, the speaker was telling, well, we all go for insurance plans and we go about making insurance so that, um, you know, after, our, after we leave our body, somebody gets the money and we think that we are protected, but uh, if we, in the hindsight, we are actually not protected because we have to give our body to, give, you know, give somebody else the money. And he was telling that, um, Krishna has the best insurance plans because he will make sure that our consciousness is, is right and uh, it, that is not destroyed. Yeah, and I was just reading in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita how if you're attached to the fruits of your, your labor, then the result of that will accrue after death. So not only you know, do you miss the insurance money, but you also get the result in the next life because you're attached to it. So he's, but he said somebody who's unattached to the fruits of their labor has no, nothing to suffer or enjoy in the next life. You leave a clean slate. It's a nice point. The insurance. Yeah, Vital. Um, you're talking about um, satisfaction and uh, about having, um, about the prayer here where it talks about Surrendering to Krishna's plan, right? But uh, how does one distinguish? How do I distinguish what is my plan, what is Krishna's plan? For example, right, in a practical thing, uh, job, right? Uh, should I actually, <coughs> uh, if I have the desire that, okay, I should get, uh, go for a higher paying job, would that be, if I don't do it, is it satisfaction or is it laziness? Or is it my plan or is it Krishna's plan? So. Depends what you want to do with the money. It's like I know one devotee's been writing me and he's like, he's trying to get the most, the, the highest paying job he can because he plans on giving the money. Uh, and he's like, I want to make, make more money because he said that's my main service. If that's your main idea about making money, then the, the point is, anukul yasya sankalpa pratikul yasya varjanam, that you should decide. Uh, whatever movement you make in this world, decide based on uh, what's best for my service. And if something's not favorable for your service, then you should reject it. And you should decide based on sadhu, shastra, and guru. You should have these three points in your life where, where you have somebody heavy enough in your life that you can go to them and say, what do you think I should do now? And then you should know that it's in the shastra, and then you should see what have other sadhus done? 
And you get inspired by that and you move in that direction. And then adjust accordingly. As you move forward, you'll see, okay, I need to adjust a little more to the right, a little more to the left. It's not final. You find your way through life in all these different ways. Okay? You can, it, it, you can, it can be done. You just need sincerity and say, I'm going to take the instruction from the Sadhu Shastra Guru. That's what, that's what all advanced souls do. They, they, they look at it really carefully. I mean, look at Mara's uh, uh, Dasarath. No, yeah, when he was told, you know, give up your son. And uh, a Vishramita Muni came and said, uh, I'd like a little charity. He said, sure, whatever you like. He said, your son is like, oh, no. <laughs> and then, so Vishista finally stepped in and said, look it, you know. First of all, your son's God. That's one thing. And the other thing is that this is Vishramita Muni. You don't want to cross him. Third thing, this is all the plan of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, so you should do it and stuff. And even though it was a very hard decision, is that's hard. Uh, then, you know, he said, okay, go ahead. If he'd gone the other way, it would have been a disaster. But he, he took all these things in. So it's not that everything's going to come to you easily. It'll come in very difficult ways. And typically these decisions are, are, are hard to figure out. They're very subtle. This way, that way, this way, that way. Do the best you can, but base it on a sincere desire to, to follow the Lord's instruction. Shastra, follow Shastra. What does the Shastra say? If it's in there, do it. And sometimes, you, you know, you have to make the best use of, of do the best you can according to time, place, and circumstance. Don't misuse that either because that time, place, and circumstance, well, time, place, and circumstance, you can do anything you want with time, place, and circumstance. You have to be careful and that's why you have to check your sincerity. Why am I really doing this? Why am I really doing it? Vishaka? I have a question, Prabhu. Um, I heard somewhere that um, a devotee is not able to make rapid spiritual advancement because he has this fear of surrender. What if I give too much of myself to Krishna? And um, thinking, you know, about the prayer by Prithu Maharaj, 420.31, um, I feel it's not easy all the times, all the times to actually um, pray that way, Krishna do what is best for me, because when we read that verse, it's very encouraging because it's a, you know, we have a you know, a feeling that, oh, Krishna will do whatever is best for me, which, which will be always good. But we never know because the best could also not be according to what we want or it may not be the best for our material situation. So I'm still not, um, maybe it shows my lack of surrender, but um, I, I'm, I'm thinking how to really be convinced or That's take this to heart. How to do that. You have to become materially exhausted. That's the answer. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm materially exhausted, then it's easy because I, just, I give up. And, and you just decide, like, I'm not doing this anymore. Roberto Duran, round 12 against a marvelous Tommy Hagler. And he just took the towel. He was a great champion. You know, he had everything riding on it. Everyone, all his countrymen, we're, we're watching and, and like he wanted to be the big hero, but then he realized, I'm beat. This guy beat me. I can't do this anymore. He took the towel, he threw it in the ring, and he said, no mas. Those words, no mas, really effective. No more, I give up. I'm materially exhausted. I'm not doing this anymore. I had this experience in my life when I was doing my business, and uh, I, was, I put some good energy into building my business. Because, you know, I'm a householder and I wanted to, I wanted to do this. And besides, I had this feeling like, oh, I could probably do anything if I put my mind to it. And, um, you know, I was working very hard on, diligently on building a business. And one day I was talking to somebody on the phone and he was arguing with me, some customer type person. And then uh, this whole feeling came across my whole, in my whole being that I'm not going to do this anymore. It was very, it was like Tom, it was like Roberto Duran, no mas. And, and, I, and I had this feeling, I'm not going to use any more breath or the, or the muscles in my tongue to convince people to take something, to buy something that's not a set of Bhagavatams or that's not, you know, I'm convincing them to surrender to Krishna. Because it's a waste for, for me at that particular time. I'm not saying don't do business, that, that's not my point. This will come at every particular time and, and you know, 
Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Prabhupada was in business. Then uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur did his, uh, it was a high court judgment thing. But I'm just giving you my experience. It was visceral. It came through my whole system. And I realized it right at that moment. As soon as I hang up the phone, my business is going on a way back burner. And then whatever happens, fine, that's okay. So these, that was, it was a point of material exhaustion for me. That was real exhaustion. I can't do it anymore, no mas. So until you have that feeling, uh, it's very difficult to go the other way. You know, when you have that feeling about everything in material life, then it's like, I'll do it as my, whatever my duty is, I'll continue to, but my heart's not in it at all. I'm exhausted with it. I, there's nothing in it for me. And I'm not, I'm not interested in doing it. I'm materially exhausted. Then one can chant with sincere feeling. As soon as there's, if there's a little tinge of optimism about the material world, well, maybe, you know, if I just get those shoes, you know, <laughs> those red shoes, I'll look so cool. And, the, you know, I'll be, I'll be the center of attention. And, uh, you know, if I have some money and, uh, you know, those shoes, then I'll be cool. But, no, you just... Shukadeva Goswami was naked. He's like, I don't care anymore. I just don't care anymore. And then it's it's then your life becomes it's transformed into a different situation. That's, I care about something else. You want this? I, no offense or anything like that, but I got something else I'm doing. I'm I'm more interested in. But Guru Maharaj, all these situations that you're talking about are talking about better to accepting from from a point of wanting more to a point of being satisfied. But the concern with most devotees with this kind of a prayer is that, first of all, we're not ready. Um, material fatigue, I feel, comes much later in life. First, you get emotional fatigue because you invest and invest and you don't get anything back. Or you get things back and they're never enough. And you realize that this whole relationship, because I don't know, maybe it's a woman, so I feel that way, that all these relationships are just like a water on the top, underneath, you know, I mean, Krishna's handling it. But we think we're there, you know, we're controlling the water, we're in the boat, we're rowing and we have some control over this, but we don't. And we realize that this is flowing water. We are not able to hold on to anything. You know, I watch the child grow up and these realizations come. And an emotional fatigue sets in. That, you know, I'm holding on to things I can't hold on to. Mm. I'm not getting much when I'm investing so much. And I invest so little and I get so much back, I'd rather productively invest it somewhere else. But these kind of prayers linked with this concept that we are taught from senior devotees and when we sit in lectures that Krishna always tests you before he gives you something more always brings up a negative feeling in the heart that you know am I ready to be tested do I want my kid to fall sick or my husband lose his job or me to fall you know something else for me to learn something more about Krishna am I not satisfied where I am right now can I not be left in peace that is that as you said attachment to the material world that triggers that thought um, a little bit of self-analysis over the hiccups that we've had and how much Krishna has helped us does guide us. We tend to see and realize, yes, though we suffered, Krishna brought me one level more. It does tell us, but there's that fear. Can you explain that fear? We didn't get to that prayer yet. Oh. That one's, <laughs> that prayer, Queen Kunti says, let more calamities come. <laughs> We're not even asking for that yet. We're just uh, saying, I don't know what to do. You know better than me, so you decide. I mean, that's a preliminary stage. But I, just in a practical way, uh, we have to, by increments, but find, find where you can surrender now. Find that place, that tiny little place right now, that fear that you're facing, whatever it is. You don't have to do something that's beyond your means. You'll just, if it's artificial, you'll come right back to where you were anyway. But find, find out what it is that you're afraid of right now or whatever it is you're attached to and deal with it in a small way. Even the tiniest triumph, the tiniest victory in being introspective and offering it to Krishna can, can bring one a momentum which will carry one to the next level, the next level, the next level. And that's all you can do is all you can do, but all you can do is enough. And that means that act in the position you're in now, surrender to what you can now, and then you'll, you'll get more impetus to do more because it's sweet surrender. It's not bitter, actually. The mind says, this is bitter, it's going to be bad. But it's the other way around. When people actually become free from material life, read all the prayers in the Bhagavatam and go, what was I thinking? I was just trapped and being trounced by material nature, and now I'm free, and so forth. So become encouraged by them. Yes, Mataji. Um, I'm Anasa. 
I just wanted to add something on satisfaction with the material world. Are we trying to satisfy ourselves or are we trying to satisfy something that the society has defined as satisfaction? Mm, that's a good point. Because that is, where, that is where we fail. We are trying to satisfy someone else and not ourselves. Yeah, I don't even know what myself is. And I take it that some kind of social norm is, you know, I should be, live up to this level of satisfaction. Another concoction of the mind, right? Nice point. Thank you. So now I'm going to read this last prayer and then we'll stop. But this prayer is, is very powerful and it gives a, a clue to how uh, one can actually pr pray clearly. And this is uh, one eight twenty six in the Bhagavatam. And Queen Kunti says, Janmai Shvarya Shruta Shri Bhir Idamana Madakpuman Naivar Hat Yabidatum Vai Twamakinshana Gocharam My Lord, your Lordship can easily be approached, but only by those who are materially exhausted. One who is on the path of material progress, trying to improve himself with respectable parentage, great opulence, high education, and bodily beauty, cannot approach you with sincere feeling. So, akinjana, gocharam, one who is a pre, uh, easily approached by the materially exhausted man. So, before chanting, just uh, divest yourself. You can do this even before you've come to some uh, lofty level, so-called. Uh, you're already at a lofty level. You're engaged in the process of chanting Hare Krishna. So before you start your daily practice of chanting, take a moment. Fix your uh, attention inwardly and think about what do I actually have that's valuable and, and realize that uh, I don't have anything. I come to this state of uh, feeling helpless in the sense that I can't breathe without the help of, of the Lord. As Satyadev Prabhu says, I'm not breathing, I'm being breathed. You can't stop, it's, it's a machine, it's a, it's a ventilator. Uh, you're on, you know, like in the intensive care, the breathing just goes on, the heart keeps pumping. It's a, a very good source of remembrance of this. You know, if you lie on your left side and you can feel your heart beating and I have no control over it, it can stop at any minute. It's going on by some higher power. And then f experience that about your entire being, that whatever you have, whatever situation you're in now, it's a gift. Like good for your gratitude notebook. It's just, I'm being sustained, and I have nothing. I have no real say in it. Whatever I have is going to be taken away. And, and uh, make yourself uh, open to the holy name that I'm helpless. Kinchana, I have nothing. And th that you can actually do as an exercise to look at yourself and realize that I'm helpless. And that this idea of security is an illusion. The money, it's just numbers on a screen, really. Whatever you have, you have now. It's uh, you're imagining, I'm imagining that I'm protected by my, all the plans I've made, all the money I've made, all the <coughs> kinds of situations I'm in. The mind is in this uh, constant state. Let it go before chanting and realize I'm helpless. And then begin the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Then we can actually get, um, we can chant with feeling, the Queen Kunti says. Then we can chant with feeling. And that's really what we're asking for in our prayers. And we have a couple texts, and then we'll end. So this one is from uh, Rajesh Prabhu in Saudi Arabia. Jai. <laughs> Hari Bol, Jai Guru Maharaj. Thank you for this wonderful class and for the tips and medicines to concentrate while chanting. I like the points of what's in it for me and being satisfied. Nice. Those are two we can live on, yeah. And the other one is from Agandharvika Mataji. And she says, um, Dunvats, Thank you very much for the practical points to rekindle our desire to chant with attention. While it's easy for the mind to do physical service of cleaning and cooking, etc., it is very difficult for the mind to develop love for chanting. I'm sure that by referring to these lecture notes again and again, 
and by referring to Shavanadi Jal email tips, it's possible to convince the rebellious mind to remain focused. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Gandharvika. Hare Krishna. And thank everyone, we thank everyone who's joined us online today. Hare Krishna. Everyone who uh, came all the way here to this beautiful space that Lord Krishna has provided for us to worship him in. And um, it's such an um, important point to sit down together and go through these things and uh, hear the, the vibrations. And um, now we can take it out and utilize even one point, take it and apply it very carefully to your own chanting and see the result and then bring it back and share it with everybody else. Thank you very much. God prema nande adibo vancha kopaturubhascha kripa sindhubhe eva cha patitanam pavani bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha. And now we are going to.